It is truly my pleasure to be joined today, returning to the podcast, Pascal Robert, co-host of This Is Revolution podcast. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. And Freddie DeBoer of the eponymous Substack. Welcome back to the podcast, Freddie. Thanks for having me. Okay, so this is what we're talking about today. Those of us who are online know that a couple of days ago, uh, Sam Adler Bell wrote a piece in New York Magazine, you know, critiquing the term wokeness. Now, right off the bat, everyone's going to go, OMG, this is spicy. This is perhaps too online. This is, you know, we're in this realm of cancel culture and all of these terms that promote a certain kind of cultural zeitgeist that isn't necessarily always productive. And perhaps not so unpredictably, there was a lot of backlash to this article. And I wanted to sort it out because I felt like there was good stuff in here. There was some valid critique. There was some critique that I felt like was kind of missing the point of the article and a bit broader than what was actually said on the page. Um, So let's just get the thesis out for those who haven't been following this. After acknowledging that there was originally a different definition of the term woke that came out of the Black community that basically meant, you know, being attuned to the ways in which the you know, we have these systemic pressures, racism, the system is rigged in realizing, um, you know, visibilizing what is invisible there. Um, it has morphed into this term that's calling out some of the less fruitful uh, aspects of society. Here's how he def- defines it in the article. Wokeness refers to the invocation of unintuitive and morally burdensome political norms and ideas in a manner which suggests they are self-evident. I'll read that again. Wokeness refers to the invocation of unintuitive and morally burdensome political norms and ideas in a manner which suggests they are self-evident. And he goes on to say, this idiom or perhaps communicative register replaces the obligation of persuading others to adopt our values with the satisfaction of signaling our allegiance and literacy to those who already agree. In some cases, this means we speak in an insular language that alienates those who haven't stood in the same activist cultural milieu. At other times, it means we express fealty to a novel or unintuitive norm, while suggesting that anyone who doesn't already agree with it is a bad person. I'm going to start with you, Pascal. What did you make of that definition in some of the discourse? I, I found it interesting, I and mean, I've always found this kind of preoccupation with wokeness and woke dis- discourse fascinating. To disclose, I wrote an article on wokeness called The Great Awakening, how the, the, and the ruling class used for racial grievance discourse. For me, I look at wokeness as a use of weaponization, particularly in the context of Black communities, of racial grievance discourse. Now, am I a person who believes that there aren't legitimate grievances that Black people have? Of course there are. But I, my position when it comes to this type of discourse, whether it be wokeness or whether it be woke racial grievance discourse, is that this is an elite project. What does that mean? That means that working class Black people who are worried about getting union jobs, whether they be at Amazon or anyone else, are not worried about wokeness or woke discourse. Mm. Woke discourse is a posture of, even when it started within Black spaces, it was a posture and discourse of generally college-educated or college-proximate Black people who are proximate also to the same type of liberal foundations and foundation largesse that create the echo chamber of ideology that will funnel into media personalities and the media chattering class, whether it's the Black chattering class, and create a containment of what is perceived to be the agenda for Black people without actually interrogating what Black people who are disproportionately poor and working class actually need. So one of the things I have a problem with the article is that he frames people who have a problem with wokeness as generally being two types. Conservatives who basically do not want to expand the way in which grievance is is addressed in American society, and the popularists, I think he's referring to David Shaw's idea of popularism, that if we keep using this kind of language, it's going to scare away the normies or the Mm. white people, if you will. (laughs) My argument is there's actually... A, a series of people on the left, particularly even the black radical left, who hate this wokeness crap as well, because we realize that it does not challenge the way in which capitalism and its materialist consequences for poor and working class black people are felt in this society. And it's a petite bourgeois black elite discourse from the get go. So what do you then say, 
Pascal to folks who say, all right, sure, there, there are bourgeois aspects to wokeness and perhaps even they might concede the, the majority of things that are referred to as woke, even in the early days of woke, were pretty bourgeois, bourgeois-related concerns. But that today, the word has become so reviled by a lot of different political factions that it's getting applied to things that are legitimate and substantive. Um, and that there's some danger in leaning into the idea that, you know, woke is bad. Well, I, I, I will absolutely concede that there is there is always a reactionary penchant in American media to try to find ways to delegitimize conserve, concerns of otherized communities. These people complain too much. We Everything is fine in America. Racism is gone. What's the problem? You don't like capitalism? What's wrong with you? There's always a, there's always a, a, a trenchant means of people who are always trying to delegitimize those who want to make society a much more fair in terms of its distribution of resources overall. So mm-hmm. I agree that those people are always going to be on the hunt to find a way to discredit people who are, you know, whether you want to call them social justice warriors or not, or whatever term you want to use, whatever term of art you want to use, people who generally are trying to make society more equitable for those who have traditionally been dis- disenfranchised and disadvantaged. And I agree wholeheartedly that there's a faction, particularly in the media chattering class, some on the right, even some liberal, who want to delegitimize those concerns. At the same time, I would interrogate who are the ones making those concerns in the first place and be more particular in terms of how they're framing their reaction to those generally conservative or more conservative attacks, and also what is the nature of the attack. Is the nature of the attack on the substantive actual complaint that is being broached by those communities, or the way they're framing it, oh, here we go with the way this flowery kind of discourse. I mean, there are ways you can talk about phenomenon that, frankly, you you can just, it becomes pedantic to the point where people are like, I'm so tired of hearing about this. Mm. My God, man, how many times are you going to bring this up? And messaging in, in the context that we're talking about is something that's important. I think that what this requires is that those of us who are interested in fighting to make this place, a be- make the country a better world for those who are marginalized, need to find a better way to message ourselves so that we don't become, you know, kind of proxies mm-hmm. for these right-wing forces who are always trying to deem our discourse as, you know, the, you know, the, the outrage of the day. Now, some people read this article and there was a lot of, there were a lot of tweets and threads about the idea that Sam Adler Bell's critique of the messaging was really a way to say, look, talking in woke terms, as it were, isn't popular. It derails a broader working class movement. And therefore, what Sam Adler Bell is really saying is to throw the concerns of marginalized groups under the bus. This is just another white leftist man who is revealing his true um you know like his his deep seated like lack of commitment to the people who are part of this broad coalition that he says he wants to put together but really it's really a, a class reductionist agenda that is indifferent to the specific needs of, of individual groups freddie what did you make of that critique well i th- <clears throat> i think like i would answer that first by just like we should get really cynical and and thinking about like the place of this particular essay in the media environment Okay, mm-hmm. because um, I heard from several people whose response was, you know, the core of this essay is strong and he could have avoided all the controversy if he just had not used the word woke. Okay, there's another approach to taking to this article where you don't use woke as your target, where mm-hmm. you talk about an unfortunate element of, I mean, cause, you know, as you said in that definition, he's reacted to something that, something that I find quite annoying, which is like, the effective stance in a lot of these social justice place spaces that like everyone is already supposed to know everything, mm-hmm. right? Like it should all be self-evident to you. And you can write about that without using the word woke, right? But I, I would say to anyone like that, you have to understand like the piece probably doesn't get run mm-hmm. by New York Magazine if it does not have the inflammatory term woke, right? In other words, mm-hmm. I'm sure for Sam Adler Bell, it was unpleasant to go through the backlash to this. 
But that was the market calculation for the editors at New York Mag. They said, this is exactly the kind of piece that people hate read, scream about on Twitter, and then and through that gets tons of views, which is exactly what happened, right? And so I think in the broader sense, part of the reason why this discourse always feels so stupid, right, is because these publications are optimizing for exactly this cycle, right? Like this is this is the cycle that they want. And it's also a disturbingly important part of the financial picture for freelancers because, of course, since Sam Adler Bell's article came out and started stirred a big uh, controversy, uh, people at other publications are hiring out freelancers to write response articles, right? And this is how the sausage is made, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, um, it it would be nice to just sort of say, hey, we should use less inflammatory language uh, when, when we make these kind of arguments. But the inflammatory language is the market proposition for the people who are paying for these pieces, right? So I think that's that's one thing. Um, I think that, um, like you, I, I liked some th- uh, many things about the piece and a few things I, I, I wasn't as sure about. I think that, um, you know, I'm I'm fairly confident this is true. But if you look it up, um, the, the, the individual who popularized the term woke and who really brought it into broad national consciousness was Erica Badu, and she was doing it in the 90s, right? So we think of woke, we tend to think of a, of a, f- a phenomenon that's very much of the last 10 years, but in fact, it's 30 you know, plus years old. And she got it from discourse communities that were largely black, that had an assumed sort of set of politics. And so one of the things that's weird about now compared to previous eras is you could have a th- such a thing as a within black radical spaces vocabulary that stayed there, right? Like before the internet made everything everybody's business, we, we had these distinct discourse communities that would have their own special vocabulary where you wouldn't need to constantly def, def, uh, define everything, where you wouldn't need to constantly defend everything, right? So woke came up from a, a, a place where it was, you know, very much like a specific sort of self selected community. But in 2022, right? Um, everything is everyone's business. Everyone is always looking at each other to find things to mock. And so, like, there's a built-in cynicism that arises from all of this stuff. What I would say is this. I would say, I would reframe it, um, <clears throat> again, with apologies to the clicks uh, that New York Mag, Mag uh, gets. is to say, look, um, uh, <clears throat> the left, particularly the social justice left, in the last several decades, has made a lot of cultural inroads um, through um, making being on the left seem like a cool thing that normal people do. And then if you aren't in that space, there's something deviant about you, right? It's a way, it's like, okay, all the good people talk this way, use this vocabulary, refer to these ideas, whatever. And if you want to feel cool and like an insider too, you have to do it. And I don't, I mean, you can probably predict that I'm not a big fan of that approach for a variety of reasons. But what I can't say is that it's been ineffective in getting converts, right? Like the fact that, you know, you can pull and, you know, a lot of people off the street who have heard the term intersectionality, et cetera, is a triumph of public communications, right? I mean, you have ideas that were completely unheard of outside of Tumblr and like the faculty were not lounge at Brown 15 years ago, which now a fairly large percentage of people use. The problem is, is, you know, there just isn't a when you when you do that, when you make your ideology cool, rather than spreading it through the sort of typical war of ideas, you get a lot of people who don't really have a, a, a strong grasp on what they stand for and what their politics are. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they do know is, OK, the other side uses woke as a pejorative. So that activates me and makes me mad. Well, right? you know, there's a there's an analogy to a period of time in which this happened again in terms of American politics. And we had a very good guest on recently who I suggested to you via email. I think you should have his name is Cedric Johnson. And he wrote a book called The Panthers Cannot Save Us Now. This, this is exactly what happened to the Black Power era, is that discourse and consciousness became hip and chic, chic. And what happened, a category of elites were able to capture the movement and the actual radical potential of the politics that were necessary to, to deal with the lives of poor and working class black folk got lost in the shuffle. And mm-hmm. we ended up having conversations about, like, you know, these abstract ideas and notions. So, 
I'm not necessarily going to say that we're going to make a metaphor between what comes out of intersectionality in the Black Power era, but what I'm saying is that I don't necessarily think that it's good that people are now using terms like intersectionality or critical race theory, because I'm old enough to remember when I was studying them in law school and wonder, wondering what is valuable about this now? What mm. exactly have black people got out of critical race theory and intersectionality in 40 years that makes it so it, the, crucial to the quality of life for the majority of black people? It's it's basically a liberal idea of black thought, and most of post-civil rights black thought is liberal in that it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion into a capitalist system where the pie is shrinking. So you're basically arguing for the smaller of number of shares on the Titanic. And you yeah, also- so, Yeah, sorry. go ahead, Freddie. No, and, and you also have this weird thing where like, um, we, if we talk about like woke, there's this always constant accusation, oh, you're talking about black people in a coded way. Um, and uh, people do do that. I think that there are conservatives who just use woke as a way that they can say, refer to black people pejoratively while denying that they're doing it. But it's a very weird thing when you think about it, because black people are 12 and a half percent of the population. Right. And um, the vast majority of people who were trafficking in the in these ideas in academia, in media, you know, in nonprofits are white people. Right. And I think it's one of these many ways in which like. If you're a white person, you see an essay that criticizes woke and you kick up this sturm and drang. I think there's just a lot of tools that sophisticated college educated white people have done to sort of um, borrow offense on behalf of black people or on behalf of women or whoever. Um, and it's just it's just it's just weird. Like if you were to go on Twitter and count up all the tweets, I guarantee you the dominant majority of people complaining about the essay were white. But it's all done under the guys of like a theoretical black pe person who's being right. insulted. Well, right. Part of this, and you, you actually addressed this in your essay, uh, Freddie, which I found that you, you talked about what an academia that calls standpoint epistemology or standpoint theory, which is the position or the idea that a, a woman, a black person, a Latino is better adept to understand the politics, worldview, and notion of person X, Y, and Z because they're from that standpoint. I think the best example of kind of the bankruptcy of standpoint of physiology, epistemology or standpoint theory is Clarence, Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. I was like, how will is he is the perfect example of understanding what the experience of black person, because all of this is premised on a flat, essentialized notion of racial authenticity. And one of the things that the people on, on the left that I respect, people like my mentor, Bruce Dixon, always tried to fought, fight against what was concept of, of flat, essentialized notions of racial authenticity. And one of the problems I have with so many of these ideas, whether it be CRT, intersectionality, so on and so forth, is that you find white liberals who are parroting black elites who yeah. are benefiting and profiting off of essentialized notions of black identity because it gives them also, it gives them standpoint epistemolo epistemological credit to get tenure, to get writing engagements, to get speaking engagements, to get foundation grants, and they leverage that to maintain their, their, their position, and they don't want to shake that up. This is an elite hustle from top to bottom. It so, always has been, and it's not a new hustle. So I agree with both of you in all of this. I love this. This is so rich. But let me steel man this and be the lib for a second. For sure, the critique of intersectionality is so valid. I remember the moment for me the intersectionality jumped the shark was when Hillary Clinton started peppering a 2016 campaign with that word. And the media fell all over themselves to congratulate her on just knowing what intersectionality was and mainstreaming it. I think her campaign did a significant amount to mainstream it that she hasn't it hasn't gotten quote unquote credit for. Um, and there was never any follow up in, ter in terms of what that meant and how that was going to you know, manifest in some material benefit for the intersectional population she's supposed to be attending to. At the same time, I don't know that I would go so far as to say that conceptually, it isn't useful to be un un able to understand that there are various different ways that, at, you know, lines of oppression can work on people that obviously we live in a world that discriminates against women or discriminates against Muslims or discriminates about bl against black people and discriminates against the poor. And that those different categories of disc discrimination experience intersect with each other in different ways. And that's how we understand that black feminism might look different than white feminism might look different than, you know, queer feminism, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not an unuseful concept, even if it's 
perhaps academic or largely irrelevant to people, you know, striving for more basic working class needs. Although I would argue that class is an important inter- intersectional prong. And my biggest critique of intersectionality as deployed today is that it doesn't include class, not that it includes all those other kinds of things. Well, I think there's some people who would argue that there have been uh, prior iterations of manifestations of intersectional, ex- intersectionality that were more class uh, concerned. For example, Claudia Jones, who's a very well-respected uh, early early 20th century Black left, Black Marxist figure, had you know her own kind of, she talked about triple oppression, the consequences of how, as a Black woman, class, race, and gender had a particular effect on herself as a Black woman. And I, I would I would be remiss to even dare to, to challenge the legitimacy of those concerns. However, assuming that what a working class Black woman is dealing with when she is a CNA and is trying to get a union, and what Kamala Harris, who's worried For about sure. whether or not her, you know, her, sure. her, her links membership is going to get her into the latest <laughs> elite golf club, is is because she's a black woman. They're dealing with the same thing. Is the problem I have with that because it's rooted in the standpoint of epistemology, epistemology that says black woman X. Therefore, no, no, well, that, that's actually not the case because there are variations of the ways in which black women, like all types of various identity backgrounds. Can, so I, I, I want to come to, to this standpoint epistemology point, because on one hand, I think to myself, I just I recently like a month or so ago debated Charlie Kirk. And one of his sticking points was, Brianna, you went to Harvard. How could you be? A, how No, not how could you be oppressed? How could black people as a whole make any claim to systemic racism when you, an individual black person, went to Harvard? The you know, was at Harvard in the, in the 1800s. Was it? Exactly what I said to him. <laughs> That's exactly what I said to him. But also, that is not a conversation you have with someone who has any familiarity with or any conceptual processing of the idea of intersectionality, right? Like, it's not about me claiming individually to be oppressed. I can be extremely benefited in some areas of my life, economically, educationally, all kinds of ways, and also be Black and have a very, like, discreet, then for that to have discrete effects in some narrow parts of my life at the same time. And also maybe it doesn't, you know, but th- th- this is the point, this, that, that nuance there is what gets me about some of these arguments about um, standpoint epistemology. Cause while I agree that there is a an extremely reductive way in which this is discussed, that tends to conflate the experiences of affluent marginalized people with working class and poor marginalized people in a way that undermines the priorities of working class and poor people, De-pri- you know, deprioritizes them. It also seems to me to be a bridge too far to say there isn't something there that can be gained from, and I know this is going to be controversial, people are going to come at me for it, from lived experiences. Even if it's only, I'm literally black and I'm literally in this skin and I have different SPF needs <laughs> than, than Freddie here. There is, there is something that, and, and again, that's not all black people, right? There are black people who are very pale, but there does seem to be, you know, like there's no other world where let's say I have a plumbing problem. I can say all plumbers aren't going to be able to fix my toilet. And there are some non plumbers who might be able to fix my toilet better than people who are certified plumbers. You can't essentialize anybody. But on the whole, I think it's fair to say, hey, I'd rather have a, pro- a plumber look at it than an electrician. You know what I mean? I do think there's some, so there's a way that we sometimes... I, mean, there's, there's, I have several responses to this. First of all, okay. understand something. That now, now, the frame of reference you said is that as a Black woman, as a Black person. Let's understand it from a historical perspective. In the United States, the people who you are calling Black, in 1959, most of them didn't even call themselves Black. They were calling themselves Negro. All right. So understand understand something. The, the 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 definition of what that class is as a people shifts but, in but terms of isn't that just a semantic argument? No, it's not a semantic argument because the actual assumption of what is the essentialized normative of black identity with the rise of black power, with the rise of black consciousness, changes significantly to include a variety of things that normally were not normalized as part of quote unquote black identity. So what I'm saying is that these identities have not been fixed. They have been in flux in periods of time in history, just from that context in and of themselves. Sure. But the fact of them changing over time or being in flux doesn't mean that 
again, it, it's hard to make this argument without buying into the essentialism on some level. Or biological but, determinism or cultural determinism. Right. But but it's difficult. Like, we live in a country where there have been laws on the books for the the overwhelming majority of the country that recognize imprecisely, racistly, wrongly, but make some attempt to codify this idea of race and did so in a way that they effectively implemented it and, you know, excluded black people from living in certain neighborhoods, you know, literally enslaved black people for hundreds of years. All of these things happen. And so us kind of sitting here and saying, well, race, you know, these categories aren't real. Oh. Belies, you know, kind of belies our, li- our sorry, our lived, our, the lived experience of the thing. My position is not to say that blackness does not exist or black identity is not a thing or that they are not black people. That's all. what I'm saying is that the extent to which we assume that there is a one authentic defined blackness lends to a position where you're basically giving it a biological credence that it doesn't deserve, particularly in the realization that there is no one unified black voice and that essentialization of blackness has always been used and continues to be used as a means to choose by people who are not black what is the authentic voice of what should be or must be black. So so I agree, but here, here's what I would push back and say. The fact of those legal structures that impose blackness and have always imposed uh, a, 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 a something called blackness, usually in an effort to subjugate, means that there is a shared experience according to those legal edicts, right? That a shared experience of living under that legal system that defines you as such. And so it's not about, you know, there has been a diversity right, of black cultures and all of these legal, things. For those people who lived under those legal systems. Right. So when we're talking about, you know, blackness and black studies and black activism and, and, and arguing for your rights on identity lines, Sometimes my frustration is people say, well, identity doesn't matter when the identity has been created because of that persecution. I would, uh, and people are fighting on the right. on the basis of that, you know, fighting back against that specific persecution because I of the category also, they've been put in. I would in. never make the argument that identity or race or blackness. No, certainly not you. But you, that, you know, people matter. do make this race argument. Race is a modality in class oppression in America. Race is a modality in class oppression. Race is a form of class oppression. Black people are disproportionately rendered to the reserve army of labor for you good Marxists out there. In other words, disproportionately rendered to poverty because capitalism requires an N-word so that the majority of white folk don't have to be one. That's mm. the bottom yeah. line. Yeah. I mean, so, you guys are are you guys are yeah, debating man. like like the concept and the category of black and who's in it, right? But but I, but I mean that like those questions of who gets to be considered part of that group are innumerable and very sticky and hard to sort through. And um, you know, there is simultaneously a discourse of like you 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 don't race police someone just because that person's very light skinned that doesn't make them not black just because that person you know like the, there's a sense that everybody should be part of it. But there are practical considerations about what we mean when we when we work with race from a societal level that are never going to just go away. So you mentioned Harvard before, right? Mm-hmm. Um, these schools keep this specific data very close to the vest for obvious reasons. It's widely understood that a very common practice in elite universities is to use, uh, you know, uh, minority representation slots, diversity slots, um, simply to cream off the richest students from those groups. Okay, so yeah. um, a very common thing for an Ivy League school to do will be to seek out, um, you know, uh, the, the president of Liberia's son. Exactly. Or, uh, you know, I went to college. Right? You know, I mean, like, so, for example, Nigerian, uh, it's it's always neck and neck with Indians, but Nigerian Americans are maybe the first or second or third richest um, ethnic group in the United States. Right. Um, and so they'll go looking for the kid of a, a top Nigerian American surgeon. Um, they're not supposed to use international students in their diversity slots, but they, they do them all the time. They do it all the time. There's all kinds of ways that they have to get around it. And so um, when you look at the people who actually are being represented, 
right? You are you, you're getting an awful lot of black one percenters. You're getting an awful lot of people whose families have come to the country in the last ten or twenty years, and <clears throat> look like I think it's great if there are more you know black faces at Harvard, but the point of race based affirmative action to me is to address injustice by helping out the you know american born descendants of african slaves right like that's a very specific kind of a population and you if you no go arg- you'll get no argument from me my friends and i often discuss that out of the 160 or so black kids in our class right. we counted 10 of us that were black american right and so you have to like for me, that the the program is just not fulfilling its mandate if it means the difference between a kid, you know, going to uh, Amherst now gets sent to Harvard. If if that person is getting lifted out of that by that diversity slot, then that's you know to, to me it's undermining the reason to well, do. My argument would be that I don't disagree with that at all. But then is that have you looked at the demographics of the kids who are Black American who were going to those schools in the first place? They weren't exactly the brothers and sisters. I knew a South Jamaica Queens who no. were exactly going to those elite schools, Correct. even though it's they were me. graduating, <laughs> even though they were graduating from the top of their high schools that were public schools either. Yeah. But with, with yeah. the institutions would like for everyone to think that they are reaching into ghettos and pulling diamonds in the rough out, right? And so it's a way both the, you know they want these kids with rich parents because rich parents donate, and this is also a way for them to burnish their credentials as a as a good. So, and so I'm just picking that as one example of a situation where. It is obviously not for me to d- discuss who is like really black, quote unquote. But it is also inevitable that when we try to address the historical injustice that um, black people have faced in this society, you're always going to have to make some sort of historically informed judgment call about the group you're actually trying to help. I have no problem with that. I, I think that makes absolute sense. I would also make the argument that if you're actually trying to improve the condition of the majority of Black people, and you think talking about Harvard admission is the way to do that, you are a long way away from addressing the needs of the majority of Black people. And the fact that we have to use that as a modicum of what needs to be done for the majority of Black people when less than 24% of Black people even finish three years of three, three years of college is kind of a sad indication of how the discourse in itself is framed. I I agree with all of that. I will say that that we started this conversation, we got here kind of talking about how to tell who's what and is, you know, what is black, you know, what is, does it mean to be black? And I would argue that despite everything that you said, uh, Freddie, my objection to the current policy is because I do have a very clear sense of who counts and it's not being captured by the admissions criteria. But um, perhaps we should pull this a little bit back to the Sam Adler Bell article in this question of wokeness. Earlier, Freddie, you said that you think that the main issue with the article and much of the negative backlash was about the word woke. And I certainly think that's a, a good point and I agree with it largely. However, I still think that if it weren't framed around the term wokeness, which I think a lot of people, even on the left, are critical of at this point, the real thing that people have an issue with is the idea that we should frame our language, cater our language, tailor our language in a way that appeals to people who don't already agree with us. To me, that was the most controversial thing about the article because I personally will say I've gotten a lot of similar heat for suggesting that I try to frame arguments in a way that can actually be heard by a conservative voter, God forbid, a Trump voter. Because in this media space that we're in right now, a lot of folks, especially a lot of liberals, think that to try to communicate with someone who's not already in the choir, to communicate with a Trump voter, necessarily means throwing communities under the bus, you know, throwing values and principles under the bus, having a fetishized preference for a Trump voter, a white voter, a white man, a working class voter, some guy in a hard hat in Detroit, blah, blah, blah. This is a problem. This is a problem that I'm finding. I wrote a piece for Newsweek talking about basically introduction and introducing people to the concept of the black political class and how we have basically an elite ca- an elite capture of black politics. I'm sure you're familiar with the concept, Brianna, we've talked about it before on the show. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I said, I said that what we need is a black working class politics in which working class black people can work with working class white, Latino, and other communities and 
find a politics rooted in their material condition where they do not have to have these mediators negotiating their 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 position. Everyone loved the article until mm-hmm. that point. Once I suggested that there was a potential that one of the things the suggestion was to have cross cross racial coalition of black people working with other of anyone to address anyone, I was bombarded with, oh, that's ridiculous. That's never going to happen. Even though there has never been a time in American history where an economic or racial advance that black people have benefited from did not require some kind of multiracial or cross-racial alliance. Yet, Yet people who are younger than me who literally don't even remember the 70s are arguing that, oh, interracial coalitions could never work. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's right. And you get this a lot when people talk about, oh, Scandinavian social programs are great. A lot of the line that you get is, that's just not possible in America because there's no, uh, because we are diverse. And it is fundamentally, it's like this reverse, I'm not going to call it reverse racism, but there's this weird um, resistance. There's an argument that sounds very much like the right wing argument that America's diversity is exactly why we can never have nice things. The right is arguing it, the left, parts of the left liberals are arguing it. And the belief that liberals have is that the only reason, the only way that liberalism is going to prevail is through demographic change. There's this, you know, belief that immigration is destiny and that Latinos are going to all magically want to be Democrats forever and always, no matter what Democrats have on offer. And when I recently made this case in a radar where I was trying to explain to a conservative, a more conservative audience at the Hill, why liberals and leftists believe Tucker Carlson to be racist and to explain what a dog whistle is without saying the word dog whistle, with a, which a lot of people don't actually know and understand. People lost their minds. And even liberals couldn't understand that as anything other than me saying what Tucker Carlson does is good. The act of communication itself, speaking in terms that don't presume knowledge, don't presume that people know what a dog whistle is, don't presume people see the world the same way that I do, was taken as a tacit endorsement of the underlying rhetoric that I was pretty obviously critiquing insofar as I was, you know, comparing it to Mein Kampf. <laughs> and, and, and to me, like, I don't know, it strikes me that that is what is very accurate about uh, Sam Allard Bell's definition, that there's this resistance to speaking to someone who doesn't already agree to you, and almost like it's a tell. There's a belief that to even care to communicate to anyone who doesn't agree with you means you must not really be down for the cause. But I, but I think like like so much else in my picture of the contemporary United States, I just think people have given up, right? I mean, I think I think there's just a widespread belief that things can't get better. I mean, I you can you can you can chop this up into into several different um, groups. I mean, there is you know the tradition of Afro pessimism, which has become uh, quite popular in certain places. Um, but, there, but there's also you know, I know a lot of people who became Bernie Life. This is a very very that, that scared when people say that, that's that's an idea idea that comes out of academia that was plastered into black politics because of certain media personalities and black chattering class personalities that has had a toxic, toxic effect on Black social and political force. You can say, you can just say tiny easy codes, Pascal. <laughs> um, but, but, but again, like, there's also, like, yeah, so there's there's that tradition. There's um, there's the whole sort of irony boy, little nothing matters thing that is very prevalent right now. I know a lot of people who sort of became Bernie leftists or even Occupy leftists in 2011 or 2016. And the, the two Bernie failed presidential nomination campaigns Sort of, su- sort of sucked out their sense that, that that good change can happen, and I think that this that this connects with the language issue, right? Like, I agree with Sam Adler Bell that like the way that we talk to people is very important, and we're not doing a very good job of it right now. But I also think that like you 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 fixate on language when you can't change material reality, right? Mm. And so part of the reason people are so resistant to saying, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tailor my arguments to to fit more people who don't necessarily agree with me now is because they just like if i can't win anyway at least let my language be pure right and there's always this instinct like that i mean so so i um have been in new york involved in new york city uh housing activism tenants rights activism for like six years or whatever and um one of the things that is constantly sort of bubbling around is um <clears throat> there's a, a, a set of people who want to stop calling homeless people homeless and to start calling them unhoused mm-hmm. right and 
I think calling them unhoused is a mistake because homeless is a very visceral term that has a deep meaning for people and it hits them. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, it's stigmatizing, but it's like, yeah, but the condition should be stigmatized, right? We want to use the power of stigma to help rescue people from the condition of homelessness. Whereas unhoused is this mealy mouthed, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sounds temporary. Yeah, it, it, it's just, it's it's just a, like, it's just, but it's like, even beyond that, I'm like, you know, if they're sleeping under a bridge, who the, what, you know, what does it matter what you call them, right? But there is, there's this, I mean, I just think that, you know, the left is made up of people who are artists and thinkers and academics and writers and, you know, people who, who have always sort of lived in language. And so when things seem so bleak, when the structural advantage that conservatism has in this country is so powerful, I think it's very tempting to just sort of like fall back into language as the one thing you can control. I think this is, I think you've made a very good point, Freddie, but also this is a consequence of what happened in the 60s and going into the 70s where the left creeped into academia as a result of the retrenchant blowback we on our show, This is Revolution podcast, called the 50 plus year counter revolution, which is the reaction that the bipartisan American ruling class has to the 1960s and the new left in that the politics of the country created counter revolution, starting with the rise of Nixon, the hard hat rebellion, you know, the move from the, the Bretton Woods standards and the economic change to neoliberalism. Basically everything we see in American politics from 68 forward is a counter revolution against the New Deal civil rights coalition. And one of the things that happens is that period is that a lot of the radicals that we saw in the 60s, they move into academia, either to try to assess what exactly went wrong, what happened, or basically because they find it to be the only safe place they can be to try to recruit a new a new coterie of, of uh, or generation of, of acolytes to their worldview. But one of the sad consequences of that is that I think it adversely affected left politics and turned it not into a politics, but really into a faculty lounge kind of discourse. And I would make the argument that we're not talking about politics when we talk about wokeness. We're talking about discourse. And now we're forced to be in a position where we're having discourse about discourse instead of talking about how do we organize working class people in my neighborhood to come out to a gymnasium and talk about why we need to get good union jobs and why exactly do we not have the Build Back Better plan giving working class black men and women good factory jobs where they can be building infrastructure that can help improve their quality of life. Okay, Pascal, drag me for filth. It's me, the one who wants to talk about the discourse and the, do the discourse on the discourse. I admit it, it me. However, I, I would, I'm not blaming you at all because there's a utility. I mean, there's a utility to self critique. Well, well, here, here's the thing. Here's what I want to ask because I, I, I completely accept that. I think that both of you are making very strong points right now. I'm like eh, the, the, the Greek chorus over here clapping like a seal. However, here we are, and. I, I'm looking. I'm looking at online earlier today, and here's what has happened just today as we record. Lizzo, the musical artist, had put out a song in the past week that used the word "spastic." The disability community was critical, called her in, said that this is a word that's been used to describe differently abled people. I know that you are you know, a conscious woke <laughs> person and that you're not doing this intentionally, can you respond? And just today she put out a statement that has been broadly lauded saying that she's releasing a new version of the track with a word change. But of course this has ha had some people have a backlash principally in the black community who say that using the word spastic as she did is AAVE and that oh, she's allowed oh. to do it. And that it's like, cultural oppression for her to be bullied into changing the lyrics. Of course, there are people who don't like the term AAVE and it would cancel me for that because apparently there's new terms I can't even with this Amer African American vernacular. I'm English. old enough to remember when it is called the Ebonics. I am also old enough for that. <laughs> At the same time, I was also on Twitter just before we logged on and I saw that NPR tweeted a story about how there's a tampon shortage and the tweet says, People who menstruate are saying it's hard to find tampons on store shelves across the U.S. right now. Now, predictably, people who are upset about the state of gender discourse are irritated that NPR wrote people who menstruate instead of women. And so now we're having a whole discourse 
about the utility of using more inclusive language that accommodates the fact of, you know, uh, trans men who might still menstruate and also acknowledges that lots of women don't menstruate either because they're too old or too young. And so we're in a world where we're being kind of asked as leftists to defend language, to ignore arguments about language, or to agree with people who are critiquing the language. And I find often, as I'm increasingly in mixed company, a mixed political company, that language that I wouldn't necessarily die on, like I wouldn't choose that hill to die on, I feel compromised laughing along with a joke about the language or being dismissive about the language because it, I, I, you know, I, I have no issue with acknowledging that not everybody who menstruates identifies as a woman. I also understand that having a fight on that political ground could be problematic to the broader political goals for lots of folks, including trans folks. <laughs> we, we had a very good conversation on our show Saturday talking about this, about the disc about discourse and rhetoric out for the left and what does it mean to be a leftist in terms of what are you willing to fight for and stand for and we talked about the trans issue and you know we, one of our guests was a friend of a show c derek varn and he was talking about listen um at a certain point there's a people that we're going to have to be willing to defend and we should not be tolerating people coming into our chats because we had the chat was getting filled with people who were saying that we should have a left that is socially conservative, but on economic and fiscal issues should be about redistribution. So in other words, like, you know, social conservatives who are, who are you know, very, very, you know, anti-LGBTQ, but for wealth redistribution, socialized health care, so on and so forth. And, you know, Vaughn was making the argument that, they, like, you no, know, we don't surrender to conservatives just because we think we want to get better talking points for our ideas, because that's how you really get red brown alliances. That's mm -hmm. how you really get fascist creep in the left is when you start doing things like that, feeling that you have to change your politics to appeal to the right. And I said, I think you're absolutely correct in that regard, Vaughn, but what exactly do we do when we have guys making movies like, you know, what is a woman? Yeah. That are, that I'm I'm having friends of mine who are leftists text to me because they're tired of saying how do we defend this? Well, how come we can't have leftists just address this guy? What happens if you say, well, a woman is a female adult? Well, that is that's a problem. Is that a problematic answer? Let me know because I'm not saying I'm the most in tune with what the right answer should be because that's what my answer would be because that's what I think it is. But I, but I think it's like, I, I I think we often get caught in this false binary, right? Where it's either completely defend or completely abandon when the actual thing is like defend in an intelligent and politically strategic way. So the, the, the issue of, of trans issues. Um, I think that uh, we have an absolute moral duty to protect the rights, the safety, dignity, and equality of trans people. Uh, I think that we should all uh, <clears throat> recognize people by their given gender identity. I think that we should have hate crimes laws that protect trans people from uh, discrimination uh, in the way that other age, age crimes laws do, etc. Um, I think that you can do all that. And you can do that effectively as a politician without, for example, weighing in on the question of, is there such a thing as biological sex? Right? Like, the is there a biological sex? Such a I mean, but are you is, not ultimately going to be forced to ask? I mean, like this is this has now become the gotcha. Every Republican in any debate, I bet you in a, the next presidential debate or any high profile congressional debate this fall, someone's going to ask the question, what is a woman? And it's going to be a shit show. But I th but see, here's the thing. I think that there's a way that you can do that. Right. I think that you, you know, if you're a good politician, you can pivot and reframe the question in the way that a good politician can to say our purpose is for the protection and respect and dignity uh, and equal dignity of trans people. If it's 2024 and Pete Buttigieg is at a debate and they say, Pete, and he says, there is no such thing as biological sex. You are going to lose a large chunk of this country. But right. My, my concern, Freddie, is that even so. So here, here's what I really think about it. I think that if you ask someone who does not believe in trans rights or anything and does believe in biological sex to define what is a woman, they still will trip up because people are bad at defining things. Right. Like 
let's say that I'm a gender, like a, I'm a sex reductionist or whatever. And you ask me, what is a woman? I'm still like, uh, well, even the most reductionist person has to acknowledge that there are like chromosomal variations where it's not just about having XX, there's XO, there's XX, there's, there's Turner syndrome, there's all kinds of things. You have to acknowledge that there are intersex people. And I mean, there's a lot going on besides which you can't use menstruation or any of those kinds of things, because as I said, some people don't for all kinds of reasons, including just basic age chronology. And it, it is not a neat, it is not a neat definition. Moreover, I heard Hassan Piker actually do a nice little takedown of one of the interviews from that film. And he used the example of a trans man. I forget their name, but they're like, he's really, he's actually kind of controversial in the trans community because reasons, but it shouldn't be about this, but he presents very, very masculine and in a way that no one would ever try to impose a female gender identity on him just because that was the identity assigned at birth. And Hassan's point is that to the extent that people who are asking what is a woman are basically trying to capitalize on what we feel is an, an instinctive ability to identify who is male and female in quotation marks, there are people who do present so affirmatively male and female, despite that not being in their identity at birth, that the joke is kind of on the people asking that question. Because if they saw this person without knowing that they were assigned female at birth, they would, of course, say that as a man, because that is what it means to be a man to the extent that all of these definitions are relying on really, really rigid gender, um, culturally defined gender practices, which is kind of not where we should be in the first place. Right. But I, I'm just saying that, like, um, I don't trust Democrats to get in the scrum of that and do a good job of communicating it. Instead of saying, you know, what matters to me is that we we is that we all recognize the equal rights and dignity of trans people and work together to keep them safe, right? Yeah, but Freddie, I, I don't I, I'm with I don't you. want Joe Biden fucking wandering into the territory because again, with you, like, but they're going to ask him. So why can't you just say what a woman is? That's going to be the response. I mean, I I just there has to be a way to say to express total uh, support for trans rights without appearing to tell the American people that it's not the case that most people are boys or girls, right? Men or women, right? Like most people are going to observe the world. Even people who are totally accepting of trans people say, yeah, there's some trans people, but most people in the world are cisgender men or, or women. And they, for most people, their anatomical uh, reality matches their gender identity. And that's and that's a thing. There's boys and girls, but also there's trans people and they're equally valid and we love and respect them and we respect our gender identity. I just... I don't give a fuck. It's the, the definition of biological sex is not important to me, but I do think it's it's exactly the kind of trap that Republicans are really good at setting for Democrats, and then Democrats trip over their dick and, not, and are unable to answer the question. Republicans have been good at doing this for over fifty years. I mean, they they've mastered it, and on, but the problem, part of the problem that the left has is that we act like we're in coalition with liberals who want to change that, which we're not. Because the reality is, is that part of the problem of being on the left is believing that you're dealing with Democrats and liberals who are trying to fight for the material realities that change the condition of the constituencies you care about when you're not. Because what the liberals have been doing for 50 years has been advertising for the job of being the party of the ruling class, which they have become. And one of the consequences of being the party of the ruling class is that the people who control the means of production want you to do their bidding and not give a damn about working class people. So now we have two parties. We're in a situation where we have Republicans who are better at acting like they care about working class people than Democrats are at actually caring about working class people. Like, I, I would agree with that, Pascal, but like, I can't get past... Look, somehow... I spent my whole life not feeling the need to engage frequently about trans issues. There are other people who know a lot more, either because they've studied or because they have more trans friends than I do or because they are trans themselves. And I'm happy to leave those conversations to people like, I, you know, I'm happy to leave those conversations to other people who know more and know better. But it keeps coming up because the right, to your point, has made such done such a good job of realizing that this is 
a vulnerability. I don't even want to call it that. But the well, why nuance of the, the why don't we start from the position that the right is bringing this up because they don't want to talk about the fact that the Koch brothers don't want you to have a I, union. Job. I, I agree with that, and I say that every time this comes up on Rising. But it is also true that someone who is a good it sticks the landing as a good debater will just keep saying, "Sure, fine." That's true. And we can talk about economic issues in a second. But why is it so hard for you, Pete Buttigieg? Why is it so hard for you, uh, President-elect Kamala Harris? Why is it so hard for you, Joe Biden? Why is it so hard for you, Bernie Sanders, to simply say what a woman is? Right. But I mean, I, I mean I, I, I'm not sure that I have a good strategy here, but I want to point out that this is a replay of the gay marriage playbook, which was a fight that the Republicans were winning for a decade, mm-hmm. which is um constantly f- sort of defaulting to the philosophical question of what marriage is mm. right because they knew that the argument for for gay marriage was always just the presence of gay people who were in love and wanted to get married right like if you're a republican and even in some fairly conservative parts of the country you have a couple of people on their on their television screen say we're we're in love we want to get married we've been together 20 years and you just say, no, you can't do that. You're the one who's going to look like an asshole. So Republicans always defaulted back to the the sort of, but what does marriage mean? The biblical definition of marriage, how can, you know? And it's yeah. the same thing with this trans issue, which was, which is that like Matt Walsh wants to make the conversation about, you know, what is a woman? Because to do so is to, to distract from simply saying, hey, here's a trans person and here's a trans person and here's yeah. a trans person and they're living yeah. lives and they're vulnerable and they shouldn't be vulnerable in the way they are. Yeah, I think one of the responses, I mean, I'd be, I'm curious to see how this is going to start to play out. I mean, it is kind of like, why do you care? Like, why are you so obsessed? Like, weird flex, dude. Like, relax. Is this, how is this germane to your life? It's like 1% of the population. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, it's but, very but, strange that the GOP. What, what keeps coming up is like now, so NPR is in this position where they're writing this tweet. They're, NPR is now in a position. We all live in a world where we're now aware in a way that we weren't 15 years ago. We, I'm obviously, I'm sorry, trans people, like you obviously were aware. But for most of us numbskull sisses living, a, <laughs> living in, in the world, we're not really hyped to these kinds of issues in 15 years ago. Now we live in a world where it's like, okay, yeah, there are these, you know, not very frequent cases, but cases where there are, you know, trans men who still menstruate. And so when I'm writing my title for my tweet about, tampons being low, am I going to say women are having trouble finding tampons? Or am I going to say menstruating people, birding persons? <laughs> you know, or am I going to use the language which I now know is out there? And if I'm a leftist and I choose not to use that language and just to say women because I want to avoid the Twitter backlash, am I doing a disservice to these communities which I now know exist? I can't plead ignorance. And am I doing what people are criticizing Sam Adler Bell of saying we should do by throwing those communities under the bus for the benefit of having, quote unquote, better communication more broadly? Yeah, I just I think that. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I guess part of the problem is I just don't trust Democrats to message anything effectively now. Like every time I think about what could possibly be said or done, I just come back to whatever idiot is going to is going to be their candidate, you know, just completely unable to articulate themselves. I think part of the problem we have is that we're so in a position of weakness mm. that we have to focus on the I's, dotting the I's and the T's of the language because of our weakness. Yeah. That we don't con- we don't talk about how being a comrade means that you're you are not so unforgiving that maybe if I do get the language wrong, you don't come at me with a bazooka. And say, oh my God, you're a transphobe because you didn't say menstruating person instead of. Well, well I think that's right, Pascal. I, I think that's right, but I think the flip of it is true. Like, if someone makes a mistake, if, you know, if, if some, if I'm talking to somebody's uncle and they say women, I'm not gonna correct them, and I and I feel morally right in in that. Like, I'm not gonna derail a conversation to be like, well, don't you know that sometimes some people that menstruate are, are don't identify as female? Okay. However, this is a different case. I'm I'm the I'm the woke person. I'm NPR. I'm Brianna Joy Gray, and I know better. And the position that I now struggle with, you know, that I find myself in, is as someone who is being held out as a communicator, a good communicator. Am I, if I make the conscious choice to use language that is 
perhaps better consumed, more easily consumed, but is less accurate and, and in fact excludes folks that I want to be part of my co- coalition, am I not part of the problem? And if I am part of the problem, am I setting myself up for failure then by doing the right thing, but by in- incurring the Twitter hordes who are now mad at this stupid, you know, this innocuous NPR tweet? If you've come to the position where you're that deep in the thought process, then you have, then, then somehow it resonates, in, it <laughs> resonates in your conscious somehow. Yeah. If it resonates enough in your conscious to that point where you're contemplating to that point, then your conscious should be able to guide you as to what you should do. I'll, I mean, yeah, well, my conscious says I, I have to do the right thing, but it is it is a, it's a curious mission. I have come to this point kind of recently in part because of my experiences on the Hill and being confronted with the reality of being in a more politically mixed environment where people are more actively critical of stuff like this NPR tweet, which I personally don't find to be a problem at all. And being forced to weigh in on debates that I can usually sit out because it's like, this isn't my focus. I am focused on these material issues. The thing is, is um, for, it's just profoundly stupid to get worked up because NPR talked about birthing persons. <laughs> whatever. I just, just, you know, get a fucking hobby, you know, <laughs> find someplace else to put that energy. At, at the same time, my completely um, unscientific impression is, though, I mean, you know, I have a, a pretty big uh, network of trans people that I know, again, yeah, mostly from New York activism. And um, most of them don't give a shit if someone talks about mothers. Right. They're not like they're not actually they're not they're not. I mean, it, it just seems to me that like it is it is not the case that we know that the average trans person is going to be hurt by if Joe Biden says, you know, abortion is the, the most important women's issue. And blah, 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 blah. Like, I, I think that they know that they're not being intentionally singled out or hurt in that way. You know, right? and there's lots of women, again, who are not the target for abortion activism because. They are not fertile because they're menopausal, because they are haven't started menses yet. You know, there's a lot of... So I, I, ta- I, I take that point. I, I, I really do. And to what Pascal was saying earlier, you know, it's so often, like, part of why we're in this position is because there has been an academic lens put on the core priorities of a lot of these groups. And something we talked about a lot during the campaign when Bernie was getting criticized for not doing enough for LGBT issues was, you know, okay, you want to talk about whether he attended a, an HRC conference, but your candidate doesn't support universal health care, which would allow people to transition for free. Also, HRC might as well stand for Hillary Rodham Clinton. I mean, I mean... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I passed their building on the way to work and I often have that thought <laughs> on the way to the Hill. Pascal, did, did I cut you off? No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying your reflections of the struggling you have to do with NPR quotes when you're <laughs> trying to come together. And... I look. I know Pascal. I know that I'm like part of the pro. I'm part of the problem. I'm not. But... Listen, I'm not. Listen, no, no. I don't think you're part of the problem. <laughs> I think that you surrender too much to the problem's legitimacy. I, I think that's fair. And the point that you were making earlier, I wanted to come back to. I think it's such an important one. The part of what's going on here is that there is no private space to have different kinds of language in different kinds of spaces with different kinds of people. Because, because you're not the organizing internet. anyone. Well, well, also because the internet, like, there, there is a world where it's, like, not a big deal and nobody notices that I'm saying birthing person in one crowd and saying women in another crowd, depending on who the actual immediate audience is. Because, because it's like interpersonal and not made every conversation, every tweet, every thought isn't made public for a broad audience that can cherry pick it and put it in a new context in which it looks ridiculous or whatever. And that part of it is just that there's no, there's no intimacy. There's no, there's, there's no, no privacy. intimacy yet at the same time, we have people who are feeling so separated and, 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 and alone in their spaces in the same way. So we have the illusion of intimacy with social media, yet at the mm. same time, people who are profoundly isolated with these things called social media that Brianna Joy loves. Okay, so here's a, here's a I think it's a little story that I think kind of connects with what we've been talking about on a couple of different levels. Did you guys hear about this Mercedes Lackey controversy at a, a sci-fi convention? No. So Mercedes Lackey, I, I, I should preface this by saying that like, there was I don't think any one big publication went out and wrote the definitive story about this. And there's multiple versions and stuff like that. So 
Uh, some people can disagree with the details or correct me, but Mercedes Lackey is a pioneering queer uh, sci-fi writer. She's a woman who's in her 70s. Um, and she was invited to be like the, the keynote speaker or whatever at a sci-fi convention. Um, and she, she was praising, uh, uh, I, I want to say his name is Samuel Delaney, who is a pioneering black uh, sci-fi writer. And in the course of praising him, I mean, literally in the speech of talking about what a trailblazer he was, uh, she used the term colored person. And for that, um, she was immediately disinvited from the rest of the convention. They scrubbed all mention of her from the uh, uh, website. They mm -hmm. took down the video of her uh, of her discussion. Uh, and they kicked her husband off the panel that he was set to appear on. Well, Sam Delaney went on Facebook and said, I have been friends with Mercedes Lackey for, for many years. I know she meant no, uh, she meant no offense. Please don't take offense on my behalf. You don't have the right to do that. Yeah. Um, and I think the key thing there that I think complicates all this stuff is if this was just a community of people, that probably doesn't happen in the first place. And what can rule is Sam Delaney saying, hey, chill out. She's in her 70s and she she used a bad turn of phrase. Um, but the the convention is an institution. Right. And part of the problem with all this stuff, if if, if quote unquote woke language or that sort of thing was just happening between people, I think the temperature would be turned down a lot on this stuff and it would be easier to deal with. But the problem is, is institutions like universities and employers and nonprofits, whatever, they have such an intense risk avoidance bias, right? Mm -hmm. They have such a, a, a deep desire to avoid it, to be appearing to be in any kind of a racial controversy that they always take out the biggest stick that they can because that's what's in the best interest of them as an institution. Just let's get out ahead of this thing and let's, and let's crush it. And so, you know, that, that stuff happened like apparently like literally overnight, like she was just disappeared from the whole thing because that institution, right. Couldn't be a human being and say, no, this person's my friend. It's not a big deal. She didn't mean offense. And so I think part of the, what makes the woke wars so much nastier than they have to be is that just, there's always lurking, the sort of the sort of set of institutional politics that the institutions don't give a fuck about the actual substance of the 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 like the sensitivity involved in the language they want to avoid indemnity they want to avoid they don't want to uh, you know have any risk and like so if you look at these college constant college controversies it would be easier to say oh they're just stupid college kids who cares they'll figure it out except that the institutions are forever coming down with these heavy handed responses that hurt people. And I just think that there's it's this constant dehumanizing element that comes from these things because of these institutions that makes all this harder than it has to be. And the litigious nature of society that comes along with these institutions, because once you have institutions, you have legal mechanisms that protect them, defend them, that advocate for them. So this becomes a whole morass of law and advocacy that comes around all of this that becomes a reality that, you know, people with law degrees like myself and Brianna have to fend through. Just because, you know, you, who knows? That NPR tweet could end up in a lawsuit one day. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg situation. I'd be curious to know how the person who wrote that tweet is feeling that. I mean, it was a good tweet. I mean, it's not, not a bad, bad tweet. It's you, not a bad, there's nothing wrong too, with the tweet. You are way too on Twitter, Bria. It's, it's emblematic. It's not about the tweet. All right. It's not just the tweet. It's 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 the, the subtext behind the tweet. It's the culture behind the tweet. <laughs> Look, I appreciate you guys mooting with this with me for so long, Freddie. I'm sorry we didn't get more into your article, but folks should definitely go to Freddie DeBoer's Substack and read. Social justice Advo advocates don't um, get um, don't get just exempt. I'm sorry, I have like a, a printed out with a thing over the it's title. Okay. It's a, I think it's so, social justice advocates don't get to just exempt themselves from the work of politics or something. Okay. Like that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Sorry. The word two was covered up by this stupid graphic that printed out on top of it. But it's a great piece. You should definitely read it. And if you aren't already subscribed to and following This Is Revolution podcast, you absolutely should. I think it's obvious. It's probably evident to you from Pascal's, you know, deft welding of history and facts that it's a much richer conversation than some of the abstractions that I'm guilty of dealing in and I learned so much. I do. I really, I learned so much from, from listening to you and having you on the podcast. 
Can each of you tell people where they can find the links to your work? Let's start with you, Pascal. This is Revolution Podcast at YouTube. This is Revolution Podcast at all your relative, relevant podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can find us all over. You can find me at, at probert06. You can find us at the TIR Oakland uh, for This is Revolution Podcast. We will be in Brooklyn on June 26th to, uh, for, with Sublation Media to introduce ourselves Come check us out. We'll have the advertisements to the location. As a matter of fact, uh, on our Twitter timeline. And uh, we're all over. This is Revolution Podcast with myself and my host, Jason Miles. Awesome. Freddie? And uh, you can find me at freddiedeboard.substack.com. Terrific. And to everybody who has listened through, thank you so much. As you know, this is a podcast that comes out twice a week to get Monday's premium episodes, both in video and audio form. You can subscribe at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. This is a free Thursday episode. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe. If you're listening to this, go over to YouTube and help Bad Faith channel out by liking the video there. Leave a comment. Let us know what you think. And as always, I will be doing a call-in show later tonight on the call-in app. You can call, give me your thoughts and feedback on this episode, ask questions or talk about whatever else is going on in the zeitgeist by the time this airs. I appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.